or 5W1H of flying. As we all know, 5W1H stands for who, what, when, where, why, and how of flying. Actually, I coined this uh, title when I first heard about your request. Okay, you wanted me to talk about flying, and I started wondering, what is it that I can talk about? I'm not a career pilot. I have no understanding of flying except what I learned from my own background and what I've heard from others saying and my own experience of having lived at an airport and having flown for some time. And of course, a few other things that I've been able to do as by way of Jugad. So then I said the best way would be to do a 5W1H, which really means then that we are all talking about everything that has to do with flying. So welcome to this program and a quick snapshot of what I'm going to cover. Just before I begin with the agenda, let me confess to you, I had thought of doing it over about 40, 45 minutes, but as time has gone on between, the, between your invitation to me and my preparing for today's presentation, I've added a few more ideas into this subject because flying is such a huge panorama of things that happen. Do you want me to talk about flying as a pilot? Do you want me to talk about airlines? Do you want me to talk about aeroplanes? Do you want me to talk about the airport? Do you want me to talk about navigation? Do you want me to talk about the licensing authorities? There's such a huge panorama of things that we have to get into that it's a little confusing. And therefore, this is the agenda that I have cooked together. And as you can see, I'm going to start inviting you to imagine that you're flying in airplanes. So you actually get into the cockpit and get started. We'll do a quick whistle stop history of flight as it has been up to date. What are my connections with flying? My father, I owe a lot to him for this. The Bihar Flying Club, which he started way back in 1940. And of course, my connection with this entire subject. Thereafter, as you can see from the agenda, there are a few things about the essentials of an airplane. How does an airplane fly? What is the caliber of a pilot? What are the things that we need to do when we are talking about an airport? And of course, as you can see from that last bullet, there are about eight or nine things that I have tried to compress and put bits and pieces together. There also is one point about why do we fly? So let's first start off with come fly with me. If some of you may remember when it was British Overseas Airways Corporation, BOAC, and until it got changed and it became British Airways, this was their slogan, this was their logo, come fly with me. And that's how their advertisement used to be. Maybe some people who were uh, looking at advertisements and uh, thinking about flying during the 1970s and 80s, they would remember that this was what POAC used to say before it became British Airways. So let's start, come fly with me. Imagine that you're flying an airplane. Typically, three activities happen. One is that you take off. You're already sitting in the airplane. The second is that you join circuit, which means go round and then you come back and land. So these are three things that happen, but there are a whole list of things to do. First of all, you have to clear what is called a flight plan with the air traffic control. They tell you which runway to use if there is a choice of runways. Then you have to walk around the aircraft and do a visual check, tire pressures, whether all the control services, there are no damages anywhere from the previous person who has flown the plane. Check your fuel count. Have you got enough fuel for the flight and back? Then you lock your doors and hatches, sit in the cockpit, do all the pre-flight checks, fasten your seat belts, and then you start your engine. I put engine or engines because if it's a multi-engine, which means two or more engines, then of course you'll have to start both and the third as well, or the third and fourth as well. There is a convention, and it's really a convention, there's no rule about it, that you first have to do the start the engine on the right hand side and then the engine on the left hand side. Why don't ask me? You open what are called flats, flaps and slats. 
I'm going to go through some technical jargon over here. And as we go through this presentation, you will learn what they're all about. Right now, just hear me out in terms of what are these little, little pieces of jargon. So you open the flaps at about 15 degrees, open the slats also. Then you start taxiing. That means get out of the apron area, move to the taxiway, which is the path that you take and reach the runway threshold. At the runway threshold, the air traffic control has to give you clearance to take off. Before that, the controller who is in charge of your flight will first find out whether there are any other aircraft coming into land. The runway, find out what are called wind shears or surface turbulence as we call it, and then clear you for takeoff. Once he says yes, then you align with the runway center line. Turn your engine on to full throttle, 100% power, that means and then you start rolling. There are three technical things that happen during this. One is called a V1, which is a kind of point of no return. You can't stop the aircraft after that. V2 is a liftoff, which means you are at the speed at which the aeroplane will naturally lift off. And then what is called rotate, which means you pull the control column backwards towards you and the nose goes up and the airplane moves up into the air. As you lift off, once you reach a certain altitude, it's typically, I think, about 500 feet above ground or maybe 1,000 feet above ground, depending on the aircraft. You raise your undercarriage. You also close the flaps and the stacks. And then you climb above what we call a safety limit of 4,000 AMSL. For those of you who are uninitiated into this, AMSL stands for above mean sea level. And then you cut your throttle down to 80% power. You set course, that means by a gyro compass, which means it tells you which direction you want to head in. And you set course for that place. Climb to that flight level, depending on what flight plan you have actually filed with the control tower. So if the control tower and you have agreed that you're going to be at a flight level of 28,000, fine, you're going to climb to 28,000 feet. After that, you start cruising. You look around for thunderstorms and CAT. CAT stands for clear air turbulence on the route that you're going to follow. For example, if you have taken off over the sea and then you turn left because you have a flight going to, let us say, Cochin, right down the coastline, the Western Ghats coastline, you will be headed for Cochin. It doesn't matter if there's a thunderstorm up above Nashik or above Pune. It doesn't make a difference to you. But if it's on route, then you've got to be wary about it. Then you start cruising with the engine at about 60 to 70 percent power. Catch a jet stream if possible. I'll explain this jet stream when we talk about weather. Then when you reach near your destination, you start what is called a descent, which means you start letting down. You connect with the air traffic control of that destination city and then check out which runway you're supposed to use. Use spoilers if needed, and I'll explain spoilers later on to you. The engine starts idling then. You, in fact, put, push your throttle right back, lower the undercarriage, open your flaps uh, right through to about 30%, and then 30 degrees, sorry, and open your slats to descend, join circuit at a specific height, and then approach the airport for what is called a long final. Let me explain long final very simply. Aeroplanes that fly into Mumbai normally come in over the area called Panvel or Kopoli or beyond that even Lonavla. So if you join a circuit, you're joining a left-hand circuit right round going over Kolaba and then towards Panvel. And then you have to join circuit there at that height. And then you approach the airport for a long final flying in over the... Uh, Ghatkopar area and your touchdown at the airport. You align with the runway, of course. Check for wind shears and crosswinds. Use ILS, which is instrument landing system, if visibility is poor. And then you touch down with nose high. Why is the nose high? The higher your nose is, you have much better control at much lower speeds. And then use spoilers, you use reverse thrust, and once your wheels hit the runway, then you use your brakes and taxi to the parking bay, shut down the engine and actually open the doors and hatches. That 
in the last five minutes or seven minutes, I've been able to take you through on a flight which typically has taken off from Mumbai's Santa Cruz airport, done a left-hand circuit over Kolaba, gone over up to Panvel, let's say, and then turned around. So it's called a circuit. Now you'll see the significance of what I've put over there on the top saying takeoff, circuit, and landing. Now let's get into some basics. This is the kind of airplane I learned to fly in. This is called a Tiger Moth. It's a British airplane, De Havilland's, a famous organization in the aviation industry. Now, of course, it's all become British Aerospace. But this is the kind of airplane which was standard training aircraft in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. To that flight which you just flew, add a few more if you are talking about a typical intercity commercial flight which means let's say you are now going from Mumbai to Bangalore then in that case you will have to buy tickets and you'll have to go to the concourse area you go through security these are things that all of you who have flown even once you've experienced you go through a rub down check and then whatever else you go to the check-in counter with your ticket then you check in yourself and your baggage. You get a boarding pass. Tells you what row and what seat number you are assigned. Then you pass through airport center. And then await your departure, your boarding call in the departure lounge. At the departure gate, then you walk or take the airline's bus to the airplane. Board, find your seat. Hand baggage in the overhead bin. Pass in your seat belts. And like the air hostess would like to say, Sit back and relax. And that's where you are on one of the windows that you can see in this airplane. Oh, let's look at a whistle stop trip of, let's say, the last 200 years, 100 years or so of flight. How did it start off? Where was the Ugam Khan, as we'd like to call it? Man has always dreamt of being able to imitate birds and fly. And they said, why not? Heck, if those birds can fly, even the small sparrows can fly, and huge kites can fly, and eagles can fly, why not me? In the 1700s, therefore, there were things that we used to call ornithopters. They were flapping wings, and they were also gliders. In the 1800s, they created the first kind of mechanical device, a hot air balloon. Physics had already taught most of the people who were serious about flying that, hey, everything that is lighter than air will rise, hot air rises. And therefore, they created products like a dirigible or a blimp. Towards the beginning of the 20th century, you had products that we used to call Hindenburg and Zeppelins. These were all hot air balloons. And then we came to the 1900s, the Wright brothers, they flew the first heavier than air airplane, 1903, which is just after the turn of that century. It was the first motor operated flight. 1914 to 18 was the first world war. Airplanes were essentially used only for battle. 1927 was a kind of human year. That's when a few things happened. Charles Lindbergh, an adventurer, an aviator from the US, he decided to fly all the way from USA to Paris in what he called the first solo non-stop transatlantic flight. That was 3,600 statute miles. What is a statute mile? It's the same as the miles that we use when we are driving. It's about 5,800 kilometers in 33 and a half hours. Non-stop, transatlantic. Can you imagine that? And then another thing that happened in the same year was that commercial flight started, which means for taking passengers across from here to there, as well as for cargo. 1939 to 45 was the Second World War, when they were, airplanes were used for battle as well as for transportation. 1949, Sir Frank Whittle invented the jet engine in the UK. And then for the last seven decades or so, it's been a case of ever faster, ever higher, ever cheaper, and ever safer. And therefore, you come up with what we call the Concorde. One of those airplanes which I would die to see, and I did go and see it when we were in, visiting France two years ago. 
but we didn't see it flying. It was already uh, uh, shelved and we saw it in the hangar. There's a photograph I'll show you a little later. Now to connect where, where, what have I got to do with flying? Let's start with my father. He used to stay in Nashik. My grandfather was a district and sessions judge there. My father got interested in flying this way. All of you and all of us who were familiar with films know this name called Dada Saheb Palke. His son and my father were batchmates in school. And one of his trips to the UK, he brought for his son an aeromodel kit. His son's name is Nilu Palke. And this boy didn't know what head or tail or what this is and how to put it together. And he gave it to my father and said, hey, can you find out what this is all about? And my father assembled the kit and flew it. For my father, it charged his ambition that, hey, this is something I'd like to do. Be able to fly, be able to make it his life's passion. My grandmother's home savings, you know what she used to store as savings for the really essentials of the day became his Santa Claus. 1931, he came to the Club. That was the only place in India to learn flying in those days. Bombay Flying Club had started in 1931, but Karachi was certainly much better known. Jadita, my flying license is number one. My father's flying license is number six. I don't have it right now. It's in Pune with... Now my brother's passed away, but with that family, it's there in Pune. 33 to 35, he went to the UK and joined Brooklands Aero Club to learn some of the advanced parts of flying. Things like blind flying, things like night flying, flight, flight, flying instructor's rating, instrument flying. Then he returned to Karachi Aero Club as a flying instructor to teach flying. That's, that's where he had started flying. And therefore, his chief instructor there, a person called William Jones, he invited him over and said, now that you've got your advanced uh, licenses, come over and start flying here. And he would happily went across to Karachi. This is a little page that from a magazine that we call Flight Global. It's an extract and you'll find, I'm not going to read through everything, so don't get worried. But you can see that there are a few notings over there about where my dad's name appears several times. You can read through it at leisure. I'm going to leave this uh, presentation with you, so it's not an issue. That's my father and my mother. In 1937, they got married. In 1938, in April, my father flew with my mother all the way from Karachi through Uttarlai, Hyderabad Sin first, then Uttarlai, then to Indore, then to Nashik, and from Nashik, they went to Akola. That was my mother's hometown. And this was the first time, 20,000 spectators wondering, as you can see at the bottom of that picture, there's grass. That was the airplane they flew in and that's after they had finished staying in, in uh, Akola for a few days, when my father and mother were going back to Karachi, my father starting the airplane. Like you and I would start a scooter 20 years ago when there was no self-starter. Even the propeller had to be hand-cranked to start. What was his flying career like? So, as I said, he was a student pilot there, there in Karachi. Then 1933 to 35, he was at Brooklands Aero Club. He also became an assistant instructor with the Ink Sports Flying Club, which was somewhere in the UK itself. After he had got all his licenses and all that, they invited him to join in. 1934 to 38, as I said, he was again back in Karachi. Between 38 and 40, something interesting happened. The Second World War was almost coming in. Our friend uh, Adolf Hitler had started uh, flapping his wings in Europe. Airports were needed. People in Europe could see that war was going, going to start very soon. It was imminent. And the Bihar Flying Club was needed to be set up. So he was assigned this by the DGCA. What is the DGCA? Director General of Civil Aviation, which operates from Delhi. And this was the assignment given to him. <coughs> Excuse me. So for about one and a half years or two years, he was in Patna. And he set up the Bihar Flying Club. 
41 to 42, he was also assigned to the Indian Air Force. In those days, the Royal Indian Air Force to train pirates on air combat training. He was posted in Katni at that time. And then after this was over, this assignment with the Air Force was over, he went back to Karachi, 1948. After that, of course, you had partition. And then Bihar Flying Club said, Sir, वैसे भी तो आप आ जाइए अभी तो सब हिंदू आ रहे हैं इंडिया में और सब पाकिस्तानी लोग जा रहे हैं पाकिस्तान में तो आप यहाँ चले आइए ना you know this place we know you why not and I rather gladly agreed these are couple of pictures <coughs> on my phone some of my my colleagues here have also seen this plaque that my and you'll see my father's name right up there on top he had handed over in 1940 when he moved back to Karachi to a person called Captain Ahmed, who was his deputy. But then Captain Ahmed decided to move back to uh, Pakistan and therefore my dad was called back. Those dates are erroneous. I've already spoken to the Bihar Flying Club people when I met them a few uh, years ago and said that, hey, this needs to be changed. The photograph on the right hand side is a picture of his office, my father's office there and right hand the lower picture is the hangar next to, and you can see the blue color of the shuttered hangar in both the pictures. Bihar Flying Club. What was BGCA's mandate? Select the airfield, fix the direction of the runway. It used to be a 4,500 foot runway. Now it's lengthened to 8,000 feet because in the 80s, when jets started flying in, Indian Airlines in those days started flying into uh, Patna, they needed a longer runway. And a variety of other things that you can see over there. I'll leave it for you to read. 1939, my father was assigned to go and select an airplane. The first airplane was Bihar Flying Club. He actually selected and flew it and flew the plane right back all the way from Hatfield, the Havilland's main factory in the UK, all the way to Patna. We were talking, we were hearing about this locust visit into various parts of India. I think they went to Jaipur and Whereas the locust infesting. My father had spoken about getting caught in a locust infestation when he was flying over Iran. In those days, he used to talk about that. And he used to say, oh, I had ma massive trouble. And then he had to do a forced landing into Iran somewhere because there was no way he could fly with all those swarms of locusts around. So be it. 1940, the club was inaugurated. After partition, he was invited back, as I said become the big boss of the airport of the flying club 48 to 65 he was there these are the four types of airplanes and you have, you'll see the name of the tiger moth there and two other three other types of airplanes that he essentially flew all two-seater aircraft all training aircraft he was also the number one choice pilot of the bihar government every time one of these luminaries from delhi flew into bihar whichever part of bihar they wanted to they said, Hamko Captain Gokte hi chahiye. When he retired, he was the senior most pilot instructor in India, 19,650 flying hours. Even his logbook is with my brother's family there in Pune now. This is a picture of the Bihar Club. And if you'd like, to, I'm, I'm just showing it because I have it with me. And you can see my father, the gentleman in the necktie, right in the front row, somewhere in the middle. This was a send off party to his deputy, a person called Mr. G.C. Roy. G.C. Roy was his assistant flight instructor and he had gone on a transfer to Allahabad because he was selected as the chief instructor at what they used to call them the CATC, Civil Aviation Training Center at Allahabad. So when G.C. Roy's send-off party was going on, this is a photograph that they had taken. So, so much for my dad and what he's left behind for me. Where do I come in? It was my childhood dream as well. After school, what am I going to do after school? Everybody was talking about going to the IIT and then some people said, you'll go to the Delhi School of Economics and uh, lots of other people in Patna were thinking about this. My idea was to join the NDA and then fly for the Indian Air Force. In 1961, something really earth shattering happened. And there's a story about it. I was about 12 years age. There was a medical examination and then they said, hey, 
you have a defect in your left eye. Defect in the sense that it's a little weaker than the right. Otherwise, I had no problems driving right through. Until about 20 years ago, I did not even use specs. But you, for flying, you need 6x6 six six vision. So since <clears throat> I could not fly for a career, it was disappointment for me. For the next four years or so, I kept considering various alternatives. I even thought of joining the IIT. In fact, I passed the IIT written examination and I wanted aeronautical engineering. It was only available at IIT Kharagpur and at IIT Bombay. They gave me civil engineering and they gave me Chennai. I said, forget it, I'm not interested. But being an aircraft engineer is not quite flying. Similarly, then I thought, why not become a flight navigator? But by that time, navigators were going slowly out of business. I learned flying from my father, flew for about 60 hours, got my A license. A license, I'll explain to you, is what they call the PPL today, private pilot's license. There is a senior license that you get after you've done so many hours and so many more tests and so many other uh, ratings that, uh, that they call. When you get a B license, today they call it a CPL, a commercial pilot's license. We'll explain that in a moment. The cost of flying had become very prohibitive. In 1959, I know it used to be 10 rupees per hour of flying. Government subsidized. By 1967, it was 160 hour, rupees per hour. I said, forget it. I'm not going to need to get a license. I flew for the enjoyment of it. Now I don't need it. And I said, let me pass my BSc first. Then we'll decide what to do about my career. My parents moved to Mumbai. So did I after I finished my BSc. And this is the kind of airplane we call it a Tiger Moth. As you can see, they have what is called tandem seating, which means one, per one person sitting ahead and the other person sitting behind. The pilot in command is always sitting in the rear cockpit. And the, the trainee, sorry, the instructor, who is not the pilot in command, the trainee is the person who is pilot in command. So he sits in the rear seat. What are the essentials of an airplane? There's something called center of gravity and some physics and maths and all that will come in during the next few pages that I'm going to show. An airplane rotates about all three axes, yaw, pitch, and roll. Yaw is moving from left to right as the nose, the ship yaws. The ship also pitches, which means the nose goes up and down. And there is a roll which the ship also does, but it does it on a 2D platform, namely the sea. An airplane is up in the air. So it has an absolute amplitude to be able to do a yaw pitch or roll in all three axes in any direction to whatever extent you'd make the plane do. It's an important aspect to understand this center of gravity thing because of what are essentials of an airplane. There's a fuselage. We call it the fuselage. I don't know where the name came from. Is the main structure. Then you have an engine which is used for propulsion. There's a cockpit and you typically have these as your control points. You have a control column which means now what we call the steering. There are rudder paddles which move the rudder left or the right. There's a throttle and there's a fuel air mixture control. The instruments are and when I learned my flying there were only six instruments. I've got a photograph of the cockpit of a Tiger Moth in the next page. I'll show it to you. There are only six instruments, an altimeter, airspeed indicator, RPM, which means the engine RPM, then a turn bank indicator, and an oil pressure gauge. That's all. And there is a sixth one, which I've not written over there, because there's not in there is a picture which shows the fuel gauge. And the fuel gauge is up on top of the pilot. You won't be able to see it in the picture that I'm going to show. Then there are wings, which handle the lift, the turn and the bank. There's a tail plane, which handles the up and down part of the airplane, which means making it go up or down. Then the last part, which is called the fin or rudder, which moves it to the right or the left, just like in a ship. Here's a cockpit of the Tiger Moth. And here's the rear seat. And you can see those six instruments. Airspeed indicator, altimeter, RPM indicator, 
the little vertical gauge that you see on the right hand side of the cockpit is the oil pressure gauge right in the center you can see something circular something cylindrical and looking like a, a, a dabba that's really what is called a gyro compass which means it tells you which direction you go in this was a fundamental airplane way back in the 60s and the 70s this is what a typical jetliner's commander's seat looks like and the kind of cockpit you have if you can look outside the window you'll see a few cars and you'll find something happening outside it's a photograph what kind of caliber should a pilot have and when we talk about caliber we are talking about the same thing that we talk about in management what are the knowledge the skills the aptitude that you have to become a good manager so here's the caliber part of it the first one is your knowledge essentially has to be in these three areas your eyesight as i said has to be absolutely perfect 6x6 six six. you fly by what is known as the seat of your pants because like the previous picture short you are sitting over there and you have no other guidance except how your bum moves left right if it's moving downwards upwards and you get a sense of this a very rigorous medic medical fitness test happens there are stringent tests every 6 months every pilot has to go through that and clear himself or herself every 6 months education in india they say that 12th standard is just about right anything better than that is not really necessary but if you have it fine welcome what are the licenses you require to fly first is what i mentioned to you earlier the pre private pilot's license in my days it used to be called the a license and then the second one is the commercial pilot's license the cpl in olden days they used to call it the b license and you have to do a few tests flying tests a spin test a figure of 8 test an engine failure test and there's a barograph which actually charts out how your aeroplane's attitude has been while you were doing these tests can you imagine what is a fa engine failure test you are flying you have already climbed to let us say 3000 feet then based on your instruments alone the instructor sitting in in the front cockpit and he will switch off the engine you have no way of doing anything else except gliding the aeroplane down to the runway let us say from 3000 feet your plane will still glide it's meant to fly by itself can you imagine having to do this test and you don't have the permission to be able to start the engine again the propeller may be windmilling as they say which means it doesn't have any power it is not giving any thrust it's not propelling the aeroplane forward it's just wind milling because there is breeze in front of you the tigermoth used to typically fly at something like 70 75 miles per hour which is about 110 to 120 kilometers per hour in today's today when we go to pune for example on that expressway we drive at 100 110 120 kilometers per hour so what speed are we talking about in those days then the cost of learning nowadays and i uh, the difference what it cost 50 years ago but today they say for a private pilot's license at least in bombay flying club for example they charge something like 4 or 5 lakhs for a cpl about 20 lakhs or more in the usa it's about 100000 dollars plus of course if you are visiting the usa from india then you have to arrange for your own eco food and transport here is a typical jetliner's cockpit again the commander sitting on the left hand side what is known as the pilot in command and the right hand side is the co-pilot and you can see that all the instruments are ganged together and they are doubled so whatever you see on the left hand side you'll see it on the right hand side too why exactly do we fly let alone whatever <coughs> we spoke about earlier in man's dreams in today's age we fly because of transportation we want to move from one place to another therefore human beings want to move plus you use flight as a way of moving cargo from one place to the other in battle of course they are used for a variety of purposes attack defense surveillance mid air refueling 
transportation. The third one is if you have lots of money in your pocket, then you can fly on your own airplane and fly it as a hobby. I would recommend seeing some of these films. Spirit of St. Louis, James Stewart acted in that. Then those magnificent men in their flying machines. Airport, a movie that came in 1970 with Burt Lancaster and Dean Martin. Then Sully, and that's a movie that came a few years ago. It was an excellent film. <laughs> Tom Hanks was playing the part of the pilot. If you remember the story, it was where a United Airlines airplane suddenly had a bird hit and it had to land finally into the Hudson River. All 158 souls on that plane were safe, unscarred, and they all moved on to shore. And then there are airlines. So I'm not getting into that area at all about the travel, but typically if there's a matter of urgency that you have to reach your destination fast, then you'd go by air. Otherwise, most of us don't think of traveling by air. We think of taking a rail or if it's close by, then you take your car or you take a BST or uh, sorry, take an ST and move from one place to the other. Some pictures for you. That's all. Rafael, the airplane which the Indian Air Force has booked. Deliveries are going to start next month. They're still on schedule despite COVID-19. That's the airplane. This is at the Le Bouget Airport, which is one of the three airports in Paris. The one that we know of is Charles de Gaulle Airport, CDG. This is the second one, Le Bouget Airport. And there's a third one called Orly. So Paris has three airports. The Le Bouget Airport has become an airport museum. And this is a picture of the Raphael kept over there. And I walked that far from it. So I was barely 20 minutes, 20 feet away from it. And then the Aerospatial Concorde. Before I show you the picture of what I photographed, Look at some of the details. The fastest airplane ever. 1,354 miles per hour. Beyond Mach 2, they used to call it going faster than the sun. You finish your lunch in London and you reach New York before breakfast. Can you imagine that happening? Because of the time zone change, you actually had that happening. You had your lunch in London, but you reached before breakfast into New York. There's the, uh, uh, the uh, Concorde in the hangar, absolutely polished. And I said to my wife there, I said, if any of, your mu of our museums here in India could have kept anything that they had, their heritage and their traditions and the history that we all or talk about so proudly, as proudly as the French have kept that airplane. My God, there's not a speck of dust over there. But it's beautiful. Imagine flying at 1354 miles per hour, over 2000 kilometers per hour. So much for that. How does an airplane fly? Very quickly on this. The science of physics says that there's Newton's law of motion. One of the three laws said that if you push air backwards, the airplane will move forward. And that's a simple way of explaining it. Therefore, you need propulsion. There's a fuselage, it holds the cockpit, it holds. Karim sir, can you hear me? Okay. There's a fuselage, it holds the cockpit, the passengers, and you control all the systems from the cockpit. Then here comes the science of aerodynamics and you need to understand a little bit of physics here. Something that we studied in school called the Bernoulli's theorem. And it talks about the aerofoil section. In very simple terms, it says that if there is a flow of air going past a surface, then depending on what kind of camber the, the wing surface has, lift will be generated automatically. Imagine a sleek fish swimming in water and you can see how sleek that fish is. And that is how if there are any other fins or anything, it becomes a retarding factor. And a few other technical terms, the leading edge, which means the, the front edge of the wing. We're still talking about just the wing. There are slats. There are slats which slide out open. I've got pictures, which I'll show you in the next few pages of what a slat is. I'll also talk to you about ailerons on the trailing edge, also flaps, also spoilers. 
there are three key things in an airplane's wing. One is called the angle of attack, which means it has to attack the air which is coming from in front of you. And it is that air which pushes the, gives the airplane the lift. Dihedral means if you see any airplane, you'll find the two wings are lifted upwards. And the third area is what we call cord and one second, they're getting blinded. Yeah, and camber. Okay. Take a look at this. Page two on this subject, there are flying controls. The aileron has trimmers and they're ganged for opposite action, which means when the left side goes up, the right side goes down, which means you're able to bank on one side. And it's used obviously only for turning. There's an elevator, which is at the rear end of the airplane, which is for climbing and descending. And then there's a rudder, which makes you turn left or right. There's a propulsion for thrust. In the olden days, 200 years ago, it was a manpower, wind, propeller, jet, and rocket. You still need something to propel you forward. Then there's a fuel. In propeller-driven aircraft, it's typically what is called high-octane fuel, 97. Nowadays, when we talk about unleaded fuel, we are in for cars, we are using 93 octane, which is still a high form of purity. And in the olden days, when it was, there was no question of, it was just petrol, then it used to be 88 octane petrol. So it was a slightly inferior quality of petrol. So much for fuels. Every airplane has to be overhauled, which means you break it down, part purjia tor tar ke, put it back. And they call it C of A, which is called a, and every airplane over so many hours of flying, it has to go through a C of A. That means certificate of airworthiness by a qualified aircraft engineer, he or she has to certify that the airplane is not fit to fly. Look at this. This, this is a picture of a Spitfire. You can see the ailerons which are trailing on both sides of the wings. You'll see the roundel which is the Air Force uh, insignia. But you can see the ailerons. So if one goes up, the other goes down. And of course, behind that you have the behind the airplane you have the rudder and you have the tailplane also and you can see the surfaces which are movable surfaces and here's a huge big aircraft landing it has come to the end of its run if you look carefully at this picture you'll see the flaps full down you can also see the spoilers on the top of the wing which are helping the airplane to stick to the ground once it touches down. You can't see the slats in this, but there's another picture I have which will show you the slats. As you can see all the runway lights over there, you'll see the different colors and the, 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 the significance of each of those lights, the colors and those lights explains to you that you've come to the end of the runway. Let's look at the airport. <clears throat> the airport, as you and I know it, we only look at the terminal buildings, the departure side, what we spoke about when I took you on that imaginary flight at the beginning of this presentation. The airport is something which is governed by ICAO. ICAO is the International Civil Aviation Organization. It's based in Montreal. The Indian counterpart of that is the Union Ministry of Civil Aviation. And there are two counterparts to this Union Ministry of Central Civil Aviation. The first one is called the DGCA, Director General of Civil Aviation. Essentially, its role is two types. One is the licensing of pilots and their renewals, as well as the registration of aircraft and airfields. There's a third one, which is handling all the airport operations, which means the running of the airport. It's a little like they're the marketing and the manufacturing lot in an organization. So what do they do? The air traffic control is the primary responsibility. And here is a list. I won't go through the entire list of things that the air traffic controller does, but you can see the voluminous responsibility that they have. Towards the end of that list of seven or eight things that the AT air traffic controller does, you'll find two explanations for what we understand as radar. Radar really is radio detection and ranging. So that's an acronym for 
radio detection and changing. And then there's what we call a VOR, which is a very high frequency omnidirectional range, which actually identifies and connects with the radar and tells you the point on the earth, on the in the sky where that airplane is. Mumbai's airport has two runways. One is called the 0927, and the second is a 1432 runway. I'll explain to you what that means. And the last point is DGC is also responsible for accident investigation. Here's an aerial view of Mumbai's runways. And towards the top of that picture, you'll see if you're approaching from the uh, Ghatkopar side and you go over Asalfa and you come into land. So you're going diagonally down from top left to bottom right. That is the 0927. What does 0927 mean? You know, it's like a compass. North is zero degrees. And then you have a dial that goes through 90 and then 180, 270, and then back up to 360. So what the aviation authorities have done is they've taken the first two parts of that three letter, three numbers, three digits. So if it's 270 degrees, it's going westwards. We shorten it to 27. And 09 means 90 degrees. So that 0927, which is the main runway for Mumbai airport, is actually a straight geographical east-west runway. Now you will start thinking, what does 1432 mean? 14 is the side that is over Andheri and it comes in and flies in towards, I mean, it's, it's looking at Chambur Hill. 32 is 320 degrees. So for example, you're landing in over the Chambur Hill, then you are facing Andheri and you are at a, at a destination, oh, sorry, at a, uh, your direction is 320 degrees. So hopefully the 0927 and 1432 explains itself. Another page on the airports. We talked about the DGCA. Now another area of what the airport does is the Airport Authority of India. Now everything other than controlling the pilots, controlling the aircraft coming in and whatever else the air traffic control does, the airport's authority is the kind of HR manager or the administration manager. So they are not the marketing and the, the, the finance and the uh, manufacturing lot. They are the administration authority. And they look after the management of the airport. This is a new body that was set up maybe 20 years ago. I don't know when it was, but it became too tough for DGCA to look after everything. Look at the list of things that the Airport Authority of India has to do. Maintenance and repairs of all these things. Plus, of course, all the municipal facilities and supplies, power, water, sanitation. And then, of course, the charging the airplanes for landing, parking, everything costs money. The parking charges for, let us say, uh, Airbus 20 at Mumbai airport for per hour, they say, is one and a half lakhs INR. That's a hell of a lot of money. One and a half lakhs for one hour's parking of the Airbus 320. And the landing charges are similar. And then, of course, the security and everything that goes on, the safety management of the airport. All this is the Airports Authority of India responsibility. Here is an airplane flying into some uh, runway somewhere. And I just picked up this photograph. Interestingly, if you look at the runway, at the bottom left-hand side, you'll find one zero, which means its heading is one zero zero degrees, which means just south of east. East, full east would be 90 degrees that runway's number would be 09. Typically, what Mumbai has, 09 and 27. So this runway, at the bottom left-hand side, it talks about 100 degrees. And on the other side, it will definitely show 28 as the runway code. Couple of other things before we break up. I know it's getting a little, uh, shall we say, uh, prolonged, but then uh, here you are. There's something called a flight plan. I mentioned to you that you have to get that flight plan cleared by the control tower. The pilot in command or whoever's flying the plane or takes responsibility for the plane, you have to get that 
cleared with your air traffic control. The documents that are required, what kind of airplane are you flying? Where are you going? What height are you going to fly at? And the control tower, namely the air traffic control guy, also tells you a lot of things about what your responsibilities are. You have to understand the weather. You have to understand how you're negotiating. Can you imagine flying at night? Let's say you board an airplane at seven o'clock in the evening today, and you're again going to Bangalore. It's a one hour, 30 minute flight. And you're going to reach Bangalore, let's say by 8.50 or 9 o'clock, 9 p.m. It's all in darkness. And therefore, your only way of navigation is what we call terrestrial navigation, flying by the stars. We'll talk about it in a moment. But understand what the control tower has as a responsibility to be able to tell you all these things. It will tell you, for example, you'll find something called flight rules over there in that list. Are you flying IFR or are you flying VFR? And the interpretations of both those terms are here. Weather and navigation. Here comes weather. In weather, you have something called clouds, you have fog, you have surface turbulence, you have something called a jet stream and thermals. I'll explain two or three of these terms to you. A wind shear is turbulence on the surface of the earth, which means within 100 feet or 50 feet of the height of the runway. And that wind shear can move your airplane backwards and forwards. It gets shaken up severely if the wind shear is high. There is also something called a crosswind, which means your, your landing direction is, let us say, on the 0927 runway into Mumbai airport. And there is a wind which is blowing from the control tower side. If you remember, control tower in Mumbai is very close to the Sahara Star Hotel. So from there, if the wind direction is now, let us say, northwest to southeast, that's a crosswind. And in that, if you have to fly in, you have to control your airplane and make sure that the wind does not affect your landing. <clears throat> Fog, of course, is something that we are all familiar with and how flights get disturbed up in the north of the country. Everywhere you want to travel, any time between December and let us say about January, end of February, fog plays misery. There is also smog associated with that and of course pollution problems in Delhi and we keep talking about it and hearing them. Thermals is an interesting subject. Thermals is a hot air. Again, we talk about hot air rises. In the atmosphere, there is something called thermals, which means there are air currents which are rising. If you catch a thermal, you will automatically rise. Whether you use power or no power, your airplane will rise, it will gain height. How do you think all those vultures and kites fly in the sky? And those they catch thermals, they know exactly where the thermals are. They can sniff it and identify where you should go. And then way above, beyond 25 to 30,000 AMSL, it means above mean sea level, you have something called jet streams. So when you are flying, let's say internationally, you have a lot of jet streams which are flying at that height and they help you or they can abet your flying also, which means they can slow you down depending on which direction those jet streams are. There are high velocity winds in the region of 200 to 250 miles per hour. Can you imagine winds at that speed? And think about how the airplane can get affected. Your direction is, let us say you're going from London to New York and you're flying at 35,000 feet. You catch a jet stream which is going in your direction, your speed and your is enhanced. On the other hand, if the jet stream is in the opposite direction, then your speed, your speed is reduced, your ground speed is reduced, which means, and therefore you land late at New York J JFK airport. All right, then let's look at navigation. In the olden days, when I used to fly, for example, there were only visual landmarks. There was no other way of finding out where you're going. So you identified prominent places like roads, rivers. You knew where the hills are. You know what was the terrain like. Thereafter came the science and Sir Francis Chester, who was one of the explorers of the world in the 1930s and 40s. He actually sailed in a 
boat all the way around the world twice sir francis chester this guy came up with this idea of terrestrial navigation when you are traveling between let us say uh, anywhere you are out at sea nautical miles to nautical miles away from shore you don't know which direction you are traveling in and you use a little bit of geometry when you connect yourself with two stars in the sky you are able to actually plot your point exactly where are you now if you use this geometry you are able to actually map your actual uh, you can identify your milestones then there were things like gypsum charts then came gps gps of course is something that we all use today also global positioning system great circle routes is an interesting dimension very briefly you know what a great circle route is if you think about it the earth is a globe and we all know that from geography and from general knowledge the straight line distance between any two points is a great circle route it is not a straight line as you use a scale and connect for example <clears throat> last year all of you know that I, my wife and i had gone to the us our great circle route from london through to los angeles actually took us over ireland then over newfoundland iceland and then we moved into the us over canada now the straight line distance if you plot a, a straight line between london and los angeles where we went to it would take you somewhere over new york or perhaps over buffalo or over the niagara falls and you'll still reach san francisco you'll still reach los angeles can you imagine what a huge difference it makes when you're flying a great circle route so that is really technically the shortest distance between two points ifr stands for instrument flying rules as well as vfr is visual flight rules so no elaboration on that night flying <clears throat> critical components it's like flying blind your navigation therefore has to be all terrestrial you're flying using your instruments your identification is important and therefore you'll find lights flashing most of them are in red color think about all that we learned in physics from our school days red color red light has the longest wavelength and therefore rather than indigo you use red to indicate because it can be seen from a greater distance that's the power of vision you also fly using the instrument landing system when you come in it's what is known as flying into a funnel can you imagine flying into a funnel you actually have a funnel that guides you into the airport so the control tower when it says that you are on an ils approach which means let's say there's heavy rain going on like we are now going to experience for the next 2 3 months here in mumbai and you're flying in you can't see the runway until you are probably less than 1 or 2 kilometers away at that time if you can't see the runway you still have to judge by your instruments that you're coming in right on time and therefore the airport creates what is called a conical funnel for you it's a it's a conceptual idea but you have to be inside that funnel in order to descend and land into the airport correctly if you land earlier then you fly into that asalpa and uh, abbott laboratories factory and a uh, uh, couple of places in that kurla area if you don't if you overfly then you'll get into the uh, elaparle east area and hit the railway line runways and taxi ways there are markers i won't talk about that aerobatics and stunt flying i think there is a last two slides i have after that there are a bunch of pictures which will illustrate a few things aerobatics aerobatics is the art of being able to fly the aeroplane and push it to its limits your flying skills your coordination your ability to handle what are called g forces and your visual acuity most critical and the aeroplane structural strength to be able to handle those g forces aerobatics and formation that you have to have a hell of a lot of coordination between 2 3 4 5 pilots all flying at the same speed same height and in the same direction 
Can you imagine how to do that? Everybody sees those public day parades that we have and all the airplanes flying above Rashtrapati Bhavan and then uh, uh, flying towards India Gate. How do they do it when they fly in formation? There's a hell of a lot of skill involved in that. Here's stunt flying, a picture for you. Interestingly, both from the same uh, uh, Air Force. Here's aerobatics in formation. And here's the whole formation going past. 10 airplanes in what we call a VIC, V I C, which stands for forming a V. The last page that I have is on gliding. Gliding is what we call flying without an engine. There's no propulsion. But then how do you get up there in the, into the air? And therefore, the two processes that we know of one is called winch which means there's a ground winch which actually tows you with a cable and then you move and you gather flying speed and you take off exactly like an, an airplane with an engine and climb. Once you reach your specific altitude, then you have a locking system which you unlock, which means you detach the winch. The tow line means <clears throat> an airplane is towing you behind itself and it takes you up. In the Second World War, a lot of gliders were used for war, particularly by the Germans. There's a big advantage in gliders. One is, of course, it's all silent and therefore you can use them for all kinds of invasions. For gliding, typical capability amongst pilots is this. All those judgments of speed, range, here come thermal currents again. <clears throat> if you want to fly long distance in a glider, it's possible. You have to go looking around for, which means where are the kites and the vultures flying? Go there so that you will also get your lift and your thermals. So be it. This is all about flying that I've been able to talk to you about. Very quickly, this is a picture of the Airbus A380, which uh, we saw at that Lebuke airport two years ago. An airplane I still haven't flown on. I wish I can, but I think the airplane is now getting parked outside somewhere. Thank you. If there are any questions, I'd be happy. Otherwise, happy landing. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so you have to stop the, yeah, I know you'll have to stop the slide share. Yeah, thank, you, thank you very much. Sir. Thanks, thanks, sir, for a very detailed presentation. Good one. Some terms not understood, some terms got cleared. Uh, any QA? Otherwise, uh, we can then close the session up if anybody wants to ask something. Omar, you are on mute. I said, sir, I have no detail. I have no question. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It was lovely. So I enjoyed it actually. Great. Oh, Very especially detailed. the photograph of uh, your father and mother on that flight was quite nostalgic. Actually. <laughs> so we know picture was nice in the end. Nice photograph, last right. one, which you showed. Which one? Near the end. So your picture last one. Nice photo. Last one, nah. Tum agla ke Raul. <laughs> Bilkul, <laughs> <laughs> Done, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Pradeep, sir. Thanks. Thanks, Pradeep, sir. Thank Can you. we have a big round Thank of applause you. for Pradeep, sir, sir? Thank you very sure, much, sir. Sure. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank Thank you. Sir. Thank you for proposing this idea. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next. Next, I will tell you that Sanjay, sir, is yoga. Not tennis. Not tennis. <laughs> I'll let you know. Anyways, thank you, thank you everybody. Thanks. Thank uh, and some messages will come on the group. Yep. Thanks. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep, sir.